If you have your Bibles, uh, if you can turn to 1 John, just kind of go to the back, right? And then you go back a little bit, you know, from there. You get the Revelation in the back, and then you just can move forward a little bit, and you get the three very short letters that John wrote, the first of them. Uh, he begins like this. Uh, very well known to some, maybe not so much to others. Not everybody who comes to church is uh, well versed in that, but... Um, but we want you to be, so just listen and follow. If you don't have your own copy of God's Word, just follow on the screen. John says it like this. What was from the beginning? What we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the Word of life, that life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you a little bit uh, this morning about fellowship, I mean, about a testimony, a witness, not so much just covering word by word this text as we sometimes do, but more in a thematic kind of way. We're in this series that we have, we have kind of named called because we realize that, that being a Christian, a follower of Jesus is to be, it's a calling. It's not just a decision we kind of make and like we make so many other decisions. This is a calling upon our life. It speaks to who we are, our identity. So we, we dealt with what it means to be called and understanding our calling uh, and our following of Jesus that way. We talked about being called to surrender, about being called uh, uh, to give a confession. Again, that is what flows from our DNA. Once we become Christians, that is who we are. And, and the same will be true as we talk about a testimony. You know, we, we don't use that word much anymore, right? A witness, testimony, it's just kind of not a common word. For some people, it sounds really old-fashioned. You know, outside of a courtroom, right? We understand in the courtroom that, that we have witnesses, and a witness or someone who gives a testimony is someone that is called in to kind of tell something that they have experienced related to the case so that they become evidence. They are like proof that this really did happen. That's why they're called in as witnesses. The word really, the English word testimony, comes from a Latin word, which is testis. And that word really means uh, a third person standing by. Are you hearing this? And, and kind of an intriguing thing when you think, well, of course, we just translated testimony or witness when we translate it. But it, 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 if we break the word apart, a third person standing by, someone who is observing, who is doing exactly what we hear uh, John is describing here, who is seen, heard, touched, being observant of some things, and they relate that. It's very powerful when you, start, when you start thinking about it just a little bit. In Christian circles, we sometimes, you know, still use that term, and, and, and it's not as much as it used to be, but usually when we say someone is giving a testimony, we are referring to them uh, giving an explanation of what happened the first time they, made God, they met God in such a way that it changed their lives, that this became a life-altering kind of moment, and from now on, everything is kind of change. It, it is that experience they relate that allowed them to become, quote, a witness, some, some, someone who had something to tell from their own life and experience that they had. You know, the new word these days is journey. Tell me about your journey. Can I hear about your journey? And, and there's nothing ro wrong with that word necessarily, but it doesn't force any kind of Christian content. Even if we talk about a journey of faith, there's no kind of necessity at least to talk about a moment where a life-altering altering encounter with the living God happened. 
And I'm not saying anything there other than, than to just simply say this. When we talk about being a witness, there's something that we have that we can explain. I saw this. I experienced this. I have a kind of understanding now that allows me to speak as a witness. In the biblical language, uh, that word that we translate uh, for witness here is a very, very strong word. It is the same word that is also the background for the word being a martyr. The, the word for witness is martyre or martyria, uh, depending on that's a verb or, or noun. And so implicit in that word is the understanding that here is something that is worth dying for. In fact, even living for. Here's a message that has such a quality that is of such significance, such life-altering kind of importance that we have to find the strongest word we know to describe it. What are we going to call that kind of thing? And that's really what we see when we see that word. In, in other words, this is not just something that is good. This is not such something that is helpful. They're not something that is important. This is necessary. We may put it in, in this way. We may say that when something is worth dying for, it's also worth living for. Unless it's worth dying for, it certainly is not worth living for. Are we hearing this? A Christian testimony is a message that you have found something that is so important, something that is so deep, that has such high quality, that carries such significance, even in life-altering kind of way, that it is not only worth dying for, it is worth giving your whole life to. So when I started contemplating and thinking about that word that implicitly carries those kind of notions, I had to ask myself, and I'm going to ask you the same thing. Does my life, does your life carry the kind of witness that through words and through deeds will kind of give a message that I have found something that is worth dying for. And because of that, even more so worth living for. You have found something that is not just good and helpful and decent, but something that is necessary. Something that speaks about the truth of life. You know, one of the greatest missiologists that, that uh, we've had in, in modern times, uh, certainly in the, in the 20th century, a guy called Leslie Newbegin, he said, one of the issues that we have with the church today is that we have given into pluralism. You know, pluralism is the idea that, that, you know, there are all kinds of ideas out there. They all run parallel. Some hold to these and some hold to these. We're not, no longer asking questions about fact and truth. We're asking questions about value and meaning. So, so what, what he's saying by this, he says, you know, two plus two is four. That is a fact that God has created the world and he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for our sin is just a value statement. And he said, as, as a church buys into the notion that, that there are truths here and then we have certain values, others have other values, the testimony tends to just be vapid or slow or, or not nearly as strong. But here is what he is highlighting by him not saying this, but so I don't want to claim that he's saying that, but I want to say that the point that is being made, of course, is that we are called to testify. That's a part of our identity because we don't relegate that purely 
to value and not truth. We believe that Jesus came and died for our sins, was risen, raised again, he was ascended to heaven, and he sent his power through his Holy Spirit to his church that we may be able to testify about his grace and goodness to this world. And that's truth. It's not just our kind of opinion or value or idea. I hope we see some of that. So I want to say just a, you know, three quick things uh, about the Christian testimony. And I want to say there are three emphases always in, in a Christian testimony. Wherever you go in Scripture, you will see this. It is directed toward God. It is directed toward the church. And it is directed toward the world. If you talk about a Christian testimony, it has all these three sides. A person who has met God, and after you have received his offer of salvation, after you have promised that you will live with him as Lord, your life will have a brand new direction. There's a new narrative that carries your life where before you may have been driven by a kind of a life narrative uh, that, that said, you know, it's about survival, survival of the fittest. Uh, and some of you may have been driven by another narrative that said it's about me, me first. It's all about me first. Some of you may have been driven by a narrative that said, oh, it's about having most pleasure in life. That, that is the ultimate goal. Uh, and now, when you give your life to Christ, there's a brand new story, a narrative that, that guides you and that tells you what is right and wrong and what the aim is and the purpose of your life. And that, of course, is the story of God as we have it here and as we see it lived out in our Lord Jesus Christ. So to be a Christian is to live a life that is directed toward God. To live a life that becomes one big worship experience, what you will, if you will. You know, you don't ever make the mistake of reducing worship to something that happens during an hour or two on a Sunday or, or some other day uh, in the week. To be a Christian is to bring a testimony to God that, uh, about you taking him serious. A Christian stand in contrast, if you will, to what the Bible calls sin, which in its ultimate character is evidence that you don't take him serious. I'm not talking about that people can get beyond sin. Obviously, we all make mistakes all the time, but if you don't bother, if it doesn't have any impact on you, clearly you're not taking God serious. Everything, this is the Bible's emphasis, everything that we think, everything that we, we question, everything that we answer, every thought that we have, every kind of conversation we have, any kind of reaction we have to other people's action to uh, or against us, anything that happens in our life is a testimony to God about how serious we take his presence in our life. This is where we tell him through our words and through our actions what it really, truly means for us to call ourselves by his name. That's what that is. Whatever also you were praying earlier on when we had our prayer time, this has to flow, friends, to the very top. Worship is about being in the presence of God, expressing who he is in all things, not just something we can reduce to an event a couple of times a week. It's our daily testimony to God. We hear this testimony to God that we take him serious. And our relationship with him, more than anything else in the world, regardless of what it might be, is what sets the agenda 
in our lives. That's the Christian testimony that is directed toward God. To meet in the church, of course, is, is important. Don't, don't misunderstand me here, right? Any kind we participate in the community to stand together with the family of God, to lift up his praises and to tell him collectively that we love him is an important, even more so a necessary act of a Christian. We are not here alone. And I, I want to say this. Most of us don't understand that. We are Americans after all. We know about individualism, yes? What is a group? It's a bunch of individuals coming together, yes? That's kind of how we think. Not the Bible, friends. The Bible says this is God's people. God looks at you as part of his people. He loves his church. And when you're together with his church, that's why this is not just a good thing to be in church, but a necessary thing to be in church. He looks at you and he says, here's someone who understands that he or she wants to be part of my people and help my people understand what it means to give a testimony to me in this world where we live. It is a misunderstanding when we treat church like we would treat like going to the movies where we don't really care about who sits next to us and what they're doing, or we go to a ball game and we don't really care what they think. We just want to have our experience. In the church, we're here to give testimony to God that we are part of his people, and he has called us to be just that. Can I move on and say, God desire to see us and to hear his people's collective worship of him, their collective testimony to him about how serious they take him. That's why also when we highlight that, let's show that we love where we live. Do you think in 1878, God by mistake said, you know, you know, I'm going to start a church in Allen. You know, I really don't care particularly about that, but I just want to start a church now. No. That was a deliberate thing. He saw us now. He knew we would be here. He knew everything that has happened through those 146 years as his people came together to live that out together. In the Christian life, those two sides cannot be separated if you want to give testimony to God as an individual and as a member of his people. I want to say just a couple of few more things related to that. For example, what, what, what does it mean? You know, some people get kind of frustrated with this whole thing about, about God. Does he really change just by us kind of worshiping him or us telling uh, him how important he is to us? No, he does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. His being is not changed. But, friends, listen to this. He is moved by this. It matters. Prayers and worship and life that is lived like that impacts our relationship to God. That's what's going on. We, we worship God because we know that we serve a God who is listening and acting. He considers, he considers a church when they give their testimony as a collective witness to him about their love and their relationship to him. And it was one of the sovereign experiences of a, a Christian understanding of God when we call God the Father of Jesus Christ, that God is personal. He is a person. And it is exactly because he reveals himself to be a person that our worship, our life is a personal relationship 
with God. I need you to see this. We, we're not just trying to say, well, that's kind of how it is. We want to understand from the depths of our being why this is so important. We worship a God who is a person, not one who is just a force. You know, you can't relate to a force or a power. You can only observe its effect. You know that, right? You flip a switch and light comes on. You have no relationship. You're not paying your electrical bill because you have a special relationship with the electrons that goes in the wire that makes it possible for you to switch light on or your air conditioner on. But with a person, there's a personal relationship. That's also why Paul can say, bring yourselves as a living sacrifice. The Jewish priest brought sacrifices to the altar as, an as a sign of repentance, as a sign of saying, at least as opposed to from a deep, heartfelt uh, point of, I regret that I have made these actions that are against your will. And Paul says, no, 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 you. And he always uses y'all. I should have just said y'all, right? <laughs> y'all bring yourselves as a living sacrifice. That's what it is. And if you want to know what that means, I can go all the way back to the Old Testament. In the book of Exodus, some of you may want to write this down and see when you get home, chapter 29. Here's what the instruction is. It said, when you bring an, a, a lamb <clears throat> to the altar, take some of his blood and put it on Aaron's ear, right ear, earlobe, on his son's right earlobe, on the thumbs of their right hands, on the big toes of their right feet, and then put the rest of the blood around the altar. Look at this. On the right ear that you may hear the word of God. That's a sign, right? You put it on your right thumb that you're willing to do the work of God. And you put it on your right big toe so that you will say, I'm willing to walk God's way. Are we getting this? This is the power that you see here. To live with a Christian testimony that is directed toward God is to bring yourself, all of yourself, everything, to him as a living sacrifice. I know time is running, but I got to say this also about the, the Christian testimony is, is directed toward the church. And in relationship to the church, it's about our testimony bringing service and equipping of others, if you will. Edification. What has developed in modern time, even in, even in evangelical churches, even in some strong Baptist churches, that there, there are people who consider themselves and talk about themselves as, as church members without ever showing up, without being actively involved. It, it's so drastically different from the New Testament that there's not even a word for it. The very name Christian was a nickname that was given to people because they looked like something Christ would be about. You know, it was given to the first time in, in the book of Acts. If you wonder where does that name come from, Acts chapter 11, you will see there's been a great persecution of the Christians down in Jerusalem, and they ran up to, to the third largest city in the world at that town, a town called Antioch, and, and, you know, part of the, I mean, all, of course, to escape the persecution, but also to, to kind of hide a little bit. But then they couldn't shut up. They had to share their testimony. It was part of the DNA. They could not talk about who Jesus was. So they gathered in, in, in churches, right? And, and they began to share their testimony. And, and the world up there didn't know what to do with them. So they say, they're like Christ, so let's call them the Christians. Are you hearing this? There could be all kinds of folks that have been up there that have walked around in their own kind of quiet mind thinking, you know, I kind of think that probably Jesus is the Son of God. I heard someone speak about this, and then, you know, that's probably true. They were not the ones that were called the Christians. 
They were not. Those were the ones that they looked at and they saw and they didn't know what to do with because everything they said and did pointed to Christ. And friends, that speaks to us about being present, about participating. Jesus had planned it so that those who carry his name will come together to build one another up. And he equips them with gifts, spiritual gifts, the gifts of grace, uh, so that everyone, each and everyone, will have something to give to others. And so to avoid to use that kind of gift that God has given is to do damage to your testimony toward God, toward the church, I mean. A testimony that in its very essence, is directed not only to God, but to the church and to the world. And it carries within it that kind of deep sense that he has found something that is so important that it is not only worth dying for, it is worth living for. You know, our Bible gives an example of a disciple that was absent. His name was Thomas. Jesus had died he rose again, and he showed himself to the disciples when they gathered. And Thomas was not there. You can read about it in John chapter 20. And, and, and he never saw it, and he began to be filled, not with the blessing of the other, those who were in the church, but with the doubt and the frustration and, and just disbelief that filled his soul. Then one time he came back. And now he saw the resurrected Lord who showed up. And it's very interesting when, when we see that after that, the next time we hear, you know, right after that, you hear in, in, in the book of Acts chapter 1, which kind of summarizes the last part of, of, of the uh, Gospel of Luke, and they gather in the upper room. And it's like the Bible goes out of its way to say all the disciples and Thomas was also there. He got it. That's where he saw the resurrected Christ when the, all the other believers were there with their gifts and their presence and their building up of it all. You know, edification or the equipping, if you will, comes through the presence and the togetherness of the church. That's also why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, you know, when you get together, there will be some that has this gift. Some will sing a song. Some will have a hymn. Some will have a prophecy. Some will have a tongue. Some will have an interpretation. All of this, when you get together, that's gifts from everybody so that we together may bring a testimony about God's good grace in our lives. To be a Christian is not to be the recipient of blessings so much as it is to be a blessing to others. The Bible is pretty clear that gifts are given for the common good. It speaks to God's grace among his people. Let me, let me round this up by the last point that is not a smaller point, in fact, that is a key point like the two other points. That a Christian testimony is directed toward the world. It is Jesus who says, and maybe you see it here on the screen, it is Jesus who says, you shall be my martyrs or witnesses. In Jerusalem, that is right here. In Judea, in Samaria, indeed, in the whole world. So a Christian testimony is not just directed upward or inward, it's directed outward by the power of God's Spirit and with great boldness to a world that does not know God. The book of Acts is filled with all kinds of description, and if it has one single purpose, it's to show this, that the work of Jesus continues after his ascension. 
If you think of this, right? Luke wrote two, two manuscripts, had two kind of scrolls, if you will. The Gospel of Luke that ends with the resurrection of Christ, right? It's summarized a little bit in the first chapter also of Acts chapter 1, and we see his ascension. And then what? The church continues by the power of the Spirit to do what? What Jesus has been all about, yes? To show the grace and the love of God. So much that this next chapter, after the outpouring of the Spirit, the very first thing you ever see is what? Peter goes to, with John, goes to the temple to pray, and on his way, he sees someone who is paralyzed, who asked for money, and he says, I don't have any of that, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. What I have, I give you. That is exactly the Christian testimony to the world. It is a testimony about the life-altering, life-changing quality of God's presence. Just remember this when you're, some of us are, you know, a little bit more fearful just in our personalities than others, that a person with an experience is never at a loss when they face a person that has nothing but an argument. It's just the truth. They can't argue against your experience. You know, I remember I sat in, in, in class in seminary, you know, little years ago. <laughs> and, and, you know, we read an article that some theologian had written about, you know, that, that, you know, the crossing of the Red Sea, and even if you line them up a thousand wide and, you know, with this much distance in the back, and then walk, they walked a certain kind of uh, speed, you know, it couldn't happen. It would take months, whatever he's calculated. And behind me sat a student from South Korea, and he raised his hand, and, and he said, um, I don't know about this math stuff, but I know this. I live in Seoul, and there's a bridge that connects the two sides of Seoul. And every morning, millions of people cross to go to one side, and then in the afternoon, late in the afternoon, they cross to go back. A person with an experience is never at a loss with someone who has nothing but an argument. You can always speak what God has done in your life. What you know, what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've touched, that's what it is. You know what we, and I'm going to end with this, when sometimes we see it's hard to find joy. It's hard sometimes to find true excitement, even kind of jubilation in our hearts for the Christian faith. Sometimes that comes because we have lost the law in the spiritual world that there's a direct connection with bringing the testimony and experience the presence of God. The spirit-filled life brings out that testimony that brings joy and excitement and gratitude back to your life. You know, to separate the two would be to try to fill your lungs with air without breathing or, or try to quench your thirst without drinking. These two things kind of belong together. So I want to say one thing. Share your testimony, friends. It's the calling on your life if Jesus is your Lord. Share it. Share it so that you see it's directed toward God. God, you see my life. I take you serious. That it's directed toward the church. I'm going to use my gift in the service of God's people and directed toward the world that they may see not knowing God is to miss the truth about who he is, who we are, what the world is about, and why we're here. Not just our opinion, not just some kind of va you know, value system, but the truth about reality. Oh, we get this. Friends, 
I'm praying that I'm getting this. And I'm praying that you're getting this. Lord, will you speak to us? By your Spirit. We confess, Lord, how easy it is to forget that every step that we take, every word that we speak, every reaction that we have is a testimony to you about our allegiance to the Almighty. Lord, let us never miss the point that the grace you have given us, you gave us to share. The giftings we have, the lips with which we can speak, the heart that overflows. May we know, Lord, that we are sharing truth and we have to do it, that it is a necessity, that the daily Bible reading, the daily prayer is our daily bread. Not a good thing, not even just an important thing. Lord, we see and understand that it is a necessary thing to know your will and to live your life. So we pray this. And I pray this on behalf of this whole church, even each who is here and each who are listening from afar. Touch us, O oh Lord. Amen.